everything has to be in place before that. It was the first time my mother wasn't putting me down. She was talking to me as an intelligent person. I knew she meant it and that only reassured what I already know, what I'd already been thinking. I had to go back to Atlanta and get with my old crew and make real money. I didn't want to leave because I didn't want Antonio to feel like I was abandoning him. I was the only person in his family that was keeping him, that was helping him during this time. No one else did anything for him. I would call his mother and give her updates. I was the only one going to visit him every day. I was all he had and I didn't want him to think I was leaving him too. The night after I talked to my mother, I spoke to Antonio, who was now calling me on the house phone at Mickey's. I would just pay for the phone calls Antonio made. I told him about uh, the talk I had with my mother and what decision I came to. He was upset and thought I was going, I was going to, I was going, I wasn't going to come back, sorry. Antonio knew nothing of my life back home in Atlanta. He didn't know the people I know. He didn't know the family I came from. He didn't know the money I made selling weed there. I assured him that I wasn't going to abandon him. I was strictly going back to make money for his defense and I'd be back before he went to court. He didn't believe me. I could hear it in his voice. I knew the only way to prove it to him was to show him. Nothing I said was going to convince him. I made all the arrangements I needed before leaving. I, contact, I collected all the money I had in the streets from those that were selling for me. I went to Stan and arranged for him to three-way Antonio's calls to my cell phone. To my surprise, Stan informed me that he had a second line in the house. None of the people in the house knew about it because there was no phone connected to the jack. He agreed to put the phone in the jack solely for the purpose of transferring the calls to my phone so Antonio could call me directly. I gave him 50 bucks for the favor. The day I was returning to Atlanta, I had an evening flight. I was in the neighborhood hanging out and I ran into Ryan, who was out of hiding for that day. He wanted to go to Foul Ball, which was the bar he was shot at. I told him I couldn't get a drink because I was on my way to a junkie's house who owed me $20. I wasn't pressed about the money. It was the principal. This was an older white man who owed me money. He was ill and I gave him two pills because he got a government check the next day. He assured me I was more than welcome to come by his house and get my money. We had done it before, but it was the first time he was ducking me. Ryan walked with me to the guy's house. As usual, his girlfriend answered the door to tell me he wasn't there. I was cordial to her. After all, she didn't know me a thing. I told her to let him know I was leaving town and I'd be back before I left. Ryan was waiting for me at the bottom of the steps of the row house. She watched me as I left and saw Ryan. He and I stepped into the street and started walking toward Foul Ball when she called out to me. J.O., hey. Ryan and I both turned around to look at her. She was speaking to me but looking at him when she asked me. Rob owes you money, doesn't he? She never took her eyes off Ryan. I took advantage of that and said, yeah. Right now he does, but in an hour, he's gonna owe him money. Ryan jumped in the conversation and said, he sure is. The tall, pretty black woman had a look of fear on her face, never taking her eyes off of Ryan. She said, hold on a minute, and went back to the house, shutting the door behind her. I looked at Ryan, trying to figure out what was going on. He had a smirk on his face and a bit of a fire in his eye. Before I could ask him what was, what was all uh, what that was all about, the woman opened up the door and said, Here, holding out a small lot of money. I walked back to the house, climbed the steps, and took the money. It was all there. She said, still looking at Ryan, I don't know what you do to him about your money, but I know what he'll do. She was afraid. I looked at Ryan as I walked down the steps. He was ear to ear grinning, chipped tooth, and full view, looking like a badass little boy with a goatee, nodding his head, acknowledging her fear, and giving her reason to have it. I just laughed and told him, come on. We walked to Foul Ball. I gave Ryan the money I got from the woman and bought him a beer. We had a good laugh off of that. I looked at Ryan as a little boy, not in a physical sense, but in a cute young guy sense. He was cute and slim. He was always laughing and smiling, being playful and silly when we hung out. He always called me Big Sis. He was so cute, he couldn't be mean. At least that's what I thought. I now know better. I should have known better all along. We have the same issue, being mixed kids in a black environment. Yeah. All right, so then.
<laughs> we can we start drinking? Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about anything? I just want to finish reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the time period? Yeah. This was, um, it started Father's Day 2003. Okay. But, and then it ended late February, excuse me, 2004. That was the whole um, time period of the trial and everything. And he's back, he's here running around here somebody might float in here tonight. <laughs> Actually, there's a few people in the book that might float in and out of here tonight. Okay. Which <laughs> ones, yeah, but they're all cool. Okay. Everybody's grown and yeah. diverse, so. But yeah, that's the whole thing is that, you know, for me, the, the reason why I have the smoke in my face on the book is because even though this is my story, I'm not her anymore. So I didn't want people to see my face on the book and then say, oh yeah, you're J.O. That's no, what that's I said. That's who I was. Matter of fact, you was here. Yeah, yeah I think. <laughs> it said, why, are smoke, why the smoke in her face? Yeah, that's why. Yeah, and I said, she probably just don't want to be noticed or crack. It's crack. No. Oh, okay. No, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I had to say he's a whore. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was the whole reason was it's just it's my story. It's just yeah, I'm not yeah. her anymore. So right. I just don't want the confusion of yeah, yeah. Because I've had people who see me after the book and they're like, Can I call you Jay? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. Well, I mean, this is the first time meeting you and I really didn't expect this like petite, demure looking woman. You were Who's like petite? gorgeous. You're Thanks, I'm sure. She's gorgeous. <laughs> and like being a drug dealer. You just don't really you know, picture and thing. Right. Yeah, right. and you know what's funny is that all the cops in the neighborhood just say, you know what, you know why everybody knows who you are? Because you stick out like a soft thumb around here. And, it's like, and when I first started coming around here they thought I was a cop, I would walk into like, let's say there was fast pizza up the block, I'd walk in and get a slice of pizza and you'd hear, phone off the hook, and that, that police were in there, it was me. <laughs> the whole time. The whole time, I didn't know. I didn't know. I, I was so green when I came around yeah. here. I didn't talk to anybody for three months because I didn't want them to know that I didn't know anything. I had never seen anything like this. Yeah, you know what I mean? Different. Yeah, it's completely different. Yes. But at the same time, you know, this area is such a tight community and it's so close and everybody loves each other. You know what I mean? And that's what I love about this neighborhood. And I'm always going to love this neighborhood and the people that are in it because they took me in as family when I was a complete stranger mm -hmm. based on who I was with and the fact that I wasn't a jerk. You know what I mean? And I treated everyone with respect and I took it, you know, I always took it to heart and I was always very conscious of this is their neighborhood, not mine. Yeah. This is where they live. And so when there was always conflict in the neighborhood, whether it be among the girls or among the guys, I was always neutral and, you know, I was always friends with everybody because there's no reason for me not to be, you know what I mean? No matter who my boyfriend was at the time. And then when he came back and, you know, because before he left, nobody was allowed to talk to me unless he introduced you to me. And then by the time he came back, like everybody in the neighborhood is walking by like, hey, Jordan, what's up? And he's just like looking like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, it's my neighborhood now. And he's like, oh, yeah, okay. So. Yeah, it was fun. And then we had a summer here, and it was like summer in New York in the 70s. It's like 20 million kids out in the street having fun, and it was just, yeah, it was just great. It was a community, you know, no matter what the ups and downs were. When somebody was up, everybody was happy for them. When somebody was down, everybody was like pushing, you know, trying to help them. And it's like, it's just a very strong sense of community out here. And I haven't really seen that in a lot of other places. You don't really see that in Atlanta as much the way that you see it here. You know, people grow up together in Atlanta. It's more like, you know, you see each other and you click up, but here everybody lives together. You know, and people in this, people in this neighborhood have been here generations, so it's a completely different, you know, element. It's more like New York neighborhoods, where, you know, like where my grandmother lived in New York. She was there like 50, 60 years in the same neighborhood. Yeah, so. I've known people my whole life, and when I was a teenager, grown people would come up to me and go, oh, you're such and such as kid, you know? And it's the same way here, and I've always, you know, endeared myself to that. 
no matter what the flaws of, of everybody was, it was like I got flaws too and I couldn't judge anybody, you know, because I wasn't doing any better myself. I was just on the opposite end of it, so. And it all worked out. You know, I had good relationships here. I come back, I visit, you know, I've moved on, but I still have my family here and my community here that I met here. And hopefully they'll be here later. <laughs> <laughs> what inspired you to write the book? So, I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, when I was a little girl, I had dreams of, I used to watch a lot of Taxi, the, sh the television show Taxi, so in my mind, I was gonna be a taxi driver, I was going to NYU, and I was gonna be an author. I always knew that. And then as, you know, life goes on, you know, you're under your parents' roof, and, and, and our, my childhood was tumultuous, my whole life it was very unstable, it was very volatile, you know, it was just a very dangerous place for children to be in, in a neglectful environment. And so, when you're, there's an old saying, can't tell a hungry man about God because all he hears is his stomach growl. So, as a child, I had to learn to survive. And I was always in survival mode and, and fight and fight mode, um, fight or flight mode. So, it kind of drowned out what I wanted. But it was like for my entire life, I always knew that I would write. And I always saw myself writing a book. But I didn't know what it was gonna be. I didn't know, you know, what the pages were gonna be. And all of my friends were telling me to write about my childhood. I don't wanna write about my childhood. I haven't, I'm still coming to terms with my childhood. And that's mainly because it's easier for me to accept my guilt and my responsibility for the things that I've done to myself and to others, it's easier for me to apologize to that than to deal with what was done to me and having not received acknowledgement or apologies for that. So when I do write that book, I don't want it to come from a place of anger. I want it to come from the same place that this book came from, which is a place of settle. So in saying that, um, Antonio, the character in the book, told me about a friend of his who was incarcerated who wrote a book. And the author had received $70,000 for the book. So he was like, and, and Antonio at the time was incarcerated. So he asked me, he was like, you should write a book. And I had a flip answer. I was like, shit, you got all day, why don't you write a book? And he was like, yeah, but I can't write, you can't. And it made sense. And then my defenses came down and we were talking about it. And I was like, yeah, but what would I write? And literally within five minutes of trying to think about what would I write, this story came into my head. Literally, the beginning, the middle, and the end, just straight into my head. Mm. And I looked at him, I mean, I was a girl on the phone, and I said, yeah, I know the story. And he was like, which one are you gonna, he's like, what are you gonna write? And I said, about you getting arrested for shooting Brian, which is Bradford, is his real name. So I said, I'm gonna write that story. And he was like, yeah, and he didn't have any, you know, clue as to how I was going to write it. And that night, I, st I sat down and I started writing it. And then, like, it literally took me 15 weeks to write the book. And then from there, it was a matter of just editing and all of, you know, those types of things. And then that was the book. What do you hope for people to come out of when they read this book? I think, I think what I want for people to come out of the book is they had an adventure. It was, a, what I want to do when I read a book is I want to escape. You know, that's the purpose of a book, to me. I want to escape, I want to go into that world, I want to be, you know, taken in and engulfed by that world, and that's what I want for people to read the book. You got a question? <laughs> That's my friend, Dan. Can you hear me? She can hear me. What changes do you see in Pig Town? Oh, I see a lot of changes in Pig Town. Um, one, I see the construction that's, you know, the gentrification, people are coming and cleaning it up. Um, it's a lot more calmer. When I've been through here, it's a lot calmer than when I was here. Um, a lot of the same people uh, are here. Like I said, the families have been here for generations. Um, I think 
what I miss about it is all the kids in the street. You know, I haven't seen many kids in the street the few times that I've come back here. There are always kids in the street. Um, the flip side of that is that the kids that I used to see in the street are now adults, and a few of them have been killed and died since then. And I think that that's heartbreaking and it's sad, you know, that, that's, that that goes on. But, yeah, just the fact that it's a lot nicer.